before I said, we could have you, we want to just start and make sure we get the name right. If you could, uh, you want him to spell his name too? Just say it. Just say your name. Forrest Hart. Where I was born. Yeah. Born in Tomo, Wisconsin and graduated from high school in 1943, in, uh, 42, 1942, in, and drafted in April of 43 and spent, uh, Time in Fort Don Beloit, Wisconsin. Basic medical, medical, and then from there I went to maybe it's, and then uh, Tennessee maneuvers uh, up and down the hills in Tennessee, and then from there to Camp Phillips, Kansas, in tar paper shacks, and then Yuma, Arizona, and desert maneuvers. And then I shipped all the way back to Fort Dix, New Jersey, and we laid around in a refreshing course on medical. And then one Sunday, all of a sudden, they, <laughs> that was after the war started, see, and one Sunday, they said, fall out with a full field pack and all your blondes out in the middle of the frame field. And I knew right then, uh, uh, that don't sound good. And we got on the train and went to New York and got aboard Queen Mary, the biggest ship afloat. I went overseas on the Queen Mary. So we, can, we, can we back up for just a yeah, minute? Yeah, back up. Yeah, tell us about uh, um, your, your parents' occupations. Oh, my a number, Your number of brothers and sisters. Tell us a little bit about your oh, family. Oh, oh, okay. And, and a little about what you were doing before you entered in the military, before you got okay. drafted. My dad was a railroad worker. And I, after I graduated from high school, I um, worked at Randy's Dairy, a dairy in Toma. And uh, then, I can't remember what you said, what other history? Brothers and sisters. Oh yes, I have one, one brother, four years younger than me, and I had uh, one sister older than me and four, four sisters younger than me. And my oldest sister is, and then my ne next youngest sister are both dead now. The rest of them are living. What about um, uh, specialized training? You already talked about your basic training. You had specialized training as a medic, is that correct? It wasn't spe specialized training, no. See, I started out as a litter bear. That's the bottom of the tier. <laughs> A lot of people don't even litter. One of my granddaughters said, what's a litter? Well, there's a stretcher. They know it as a stretcher, you know? And anyway, I started out as a litter bear and then became an aid man. And then, you know, as, as I got up, uh, went into the aid station and worked with a surgeon or a doctor. What about uh, uh, barracks, oh. the food? Social life while you, before you de deployed, before you were sent overseas. Yeah, I, I slept in a tent, a four-man tent in Camp Grant, Illinois, where I took medical basic. And then from there I went to outside living in a pup tent, two-man pup tent in Tennessee on maneuvers. And from the right out from the field, we went to Camp Phillips, Kansas, in tar paper shacks. No indoor plumbing, you know, you had to go outside to go to the bathroom, different building, take a shower and wash up and everything, and no toilets. And then the kitchen was on the opposite end of the uh, row of tents. You had to go all up there, go outside and go eat, and walk up there and eat. And then from there I went to Yuma, Arizona and lived in four-man tents in the, in, on the desert. And we didn't have no facilities there inside, you know, it was just outside toilet. And then when I got Fort Dix here, we had a two-story barracks and inside plumbing and everything. <laughs> you know. When you got drafted, did you know that you were going to be going to the Pacific or the, or to Europe? Did you have any idea? I had no idea. When did, when was, what, tell us about that, the first indication you had that you were going to be deployed either to Europe or... When I left... <clears throat> Uh, maneuvers in Arizona and we went to Fort Dix and we more or less, I would say for like two weeks or something, we didn't do nothing. They kind of let us do whatever we wanted to do. And then that Sunday morning when they called us out with a 
told us to ply out in front of the barracks with all your belongings, your, your duffel bag and full field pack and everything. Before that, we had had what they called full field inspections. They lay all, everything you own out on a bed, and then they made sure you had an extra pair of socks and a handkerchief and toothbrush and toothpaste and soap and all that stuff, you know, personal items, and then change it under clothes and stuff like that. That was all, make sure everybody had that, 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 you know, so when they went overseas, we had it. But then we were issued a lot of things, like impregnated clothing, you know what that is? Mm. It's when they were worried about gas when we first went over there being gas. And this impregnated clothing, it was coated, it was a regular army fatigue zone. It had a coating of something on it that the gas was not supposed to penetrate. And then we had the gas mask. Did you ever use those? No, I was just going to say, when we got off the, like we carried that sucker, <laughs> all that stuff in our bags and everything, heavy, it was heavy. And then when we got, when we lived in France, we got off the, we walked in on a treadway and got, went up this hill and up on top of the hill, there was an apple orchard, old apple orchard, there was nothing left of it, it was all bombed. And it was, uh, they said, empty your duffel bag out in here. And then they took, emptied our full field pack, gave us a blanket and a shelter, a shelter half or a poncho, one of the two. And then they took our pregnant clothing, took our gas mask, and we never saw them again. We carried them all the way over there all that time, and never used them, never saw them again. What was your trip across the, the Pacific or across the Atlantic on the Queen Mary Lake? Was it, it was eventful, or was it, was it interesting? Or? There was nothing unusual, because it was the fastest ship afloat at that time, the Queen Mary was. And they went in a zigzag all the way across so that nothing could catch up with them. They couldn't, you know, in, intercept them. But then we had escorts like two days out and then escorts from England on two days before we came. They came out, you know, planes and boats came out and escorted us. Because of the U-boats? U-boats, right. How old were you at the time, Doug? I was 19. 19 years old. So then you arrived? Well, actually, eight, yeah, 19. And you arrived in England? In Scotland, actually, really. But then we got right off the boat and got on the trains, and they pulled all the shades down. And then we drove across England to whatever town. I don't, to this day, I don't know what the name of the town was. And it was just like a concentration camp. It was all enclosed, great big high fences. And we were sleeping in four men tents again. And we couldn't go anywhere, and nobody could come in, or no letters out, or no letters in. We were supposed to be more or less hid, I guess, you know, so that the enemy wouldn't know where we were at at the time. I guess that was the principle. Take us from that, from the, where you are now in, in, that, in, in England, Scotland, or England, where yeah. you've been hidden away. Take us, to, take us through your journey now from there to when you went into, your first stop was in France, right? La Havre. I went, we went across the English Channel and I departed in La Havre, France. Okay, so take, and now take, that take map, us from England to France. That map in the back there. Yeah, I saw that. That'll show you exactly where we went. I saw this when I looked through the book and he's got it from, all from back in the day and I, I didn't want to open it. I, that's what the uh, Heidi, said. Heidi said. I was afraid it would rip Heidi said. This is the most amazing collection in that book. <laughs> See, now here's where we departed from Cherbourg. No, here. Southampton, England. We went across the English Channel. Omaha. I said La Harve. It was Omaha Beachhead. I made a mistake. Omaha Beachhead, then we went down to here. here. Did, you, did you land on Omaha Beach on D Day? No, no. D plus 30. 30 days after D Day. Month after D Day. Yeah. And then there and all the way through France and up into Luxembourg, the Battle of the Bulge, and then back. And then we, I was stationed uh, through all through Germany and down in Austria. And after the war was over, we 
I spent, oh, I don't know, four or five months in Austria. That was after the war was over. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Amazing. If I only had one of them little cameras like they got now, God, wouldn't that have been nice? But see, you had big box cameras, and you, everything you owned, you carried on you. This sounds ridiculous, but it's true. You just carried everything you owned because you didn't have any place to go at night. When you got, all you did when you, wherever you were at, you rolled out, you had your sleeping bag, and you went to sleep. Maybe it was in a barn, maybe it was in the basement of the house, maybe it was under a vehicle or wherever it was. I told my grandkids, how would you like to live a whole year without a bed? And just wherever you were, you slept. And they kind of laughed, you know. <laughs> but it's true. It's, it's true. That's just the way it was. And then you carried everything you, everything you, the only thing you had that was you had to put it, carry on your personal. And you could only carry so much. But if I would have one of them little cameras with them big, all them big cells in there, now, oh, wow. I could have both photographed a lot of stuff. This was produced by the Army, so you it made to be sent home, so you could tell, show people where you'd been. Right, right. That's what it says here, for right. mailing home. Yep, and they did mail that home to me. 1945. Well, let's, be, let's, go, let's go back to Omaha Beach. You got there 30 days after, uh, after D-Day. Take, take, what was your impression when you landed at Omaha Beach, and then... We don't want to go on for hours and hours, but we, you know, want to, take, take us along your journey. Okay, here. okay. Take us along your journey. This, we were called mop up. I say we, it's more the infantry. I was just in the medics. I was, you know, but the infantry, oops. The infantry were, were the ones that did all the work, you know, but we were just medics. But I said they would go into town say they would, it was a little town like Toma, say, just for instance. Well, they wouldn't, the U.S. Army would bypass it, more or less, to go to the next town. Well, then our, the, our unit would go in and they, what they call liberate it. And they'd go in and they'd run all the Germans, make sure there was no Germans in their snipers or anything else. And then when you got what they call liberated, they would go get the Burgermeier. In France, it wasn't a Burgermeier. It was whatever the mayor is. And they'd ring a church bell, and everybody would assemble around the church. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm wrong. That was in Germany. In France, you didn't do that because you, we didn't occupy. I mean, they kept their arms, you know. But when we got in, in Germany, the uh, Burgermeister, he came out and rang the bell. And then they were supposed to turn their weapons in, whatever kind of weapons they had. You should have seen some of the nice weapons that were turned in. <laughs> Shotguns and high price, you know. Because everybody had to turn their weapons in. Well, then, uh, that, and then uh, but now over in France, when you, you just go through this, liberate this town, and after it was liberated, it was usually by foot, like we would walk from. Come on to Warren's. We didn't have vehicles. It was all by foot. And except when you go like this, when they broke through the line here and went across, then they, we went on six by sixes, big transport. That's when Patton took off. You've heard about it. Patton took off and went on, raced across France and drove. And then so they ran out of supplies, Patton and the army. They couldn't keep up supplies with him. He was going so fast. But he was bypassing a lot of towns and seeing that's what we were doing. Behind him, mopping, or what do we call them? Huh? Liberating them. It wasn't really liberating in France because they were our ally, but we called it liberating. But when you got in Germany, then you could do take, take whatever you wanted. <laughs> I mean, it's true. I mean, you could just loot houses and everything because we were the occupying them. And in France, you couldn't do that. What about, you got to the, uh, the Battle of the Bulge. Tell us about the Battle of the Bulge. What, what we wrote, I was stationed at the time in Metz. And we were on a rest period. We, we, you know, a lot of times we'd be in battle for a month, and then you go back for four or five days, and then go back and it's another off. And then we got orders to, in the middle of the night, ordered to get on six by sixes that we were moving out. 
Well, we had no idea where we were moving up. You know, they loaded us up in the back of six by sixes, no, no cover on it or nothing. And we drove all the way from Metz up to Luxembourg City all night long. What time of year was that? That was in December. <laughs> and uh, I got up there, and uh, I, as soon as I got out of the truck, I just shake, shake and shiver and shake and shake. I had chills so bad, you know. And uh, I went and I had 100, 103 years, or maybe even higher fever. And so they evacuated me back to a clearing company, that was called. And I stayed there two days, and and then it, uh, it subsided, and I went back. And I no sooner got back, and that night it was right back up, and you know, just as high as it was. And so then they sent me. They knew I had pneumonia. See, I had I had contacted pneumonia. So then they shipped me all the way back down to Metz in a station hospital, which was really neat. You know, it's a burglar building with cots. The first cot I slept on in a long time. Otherwise, it was in these clearing companies, it was on litters you sleep. That's it. So we're at the Battle of the Balls. Okay, now we're at the Balls. We're going to go through Korea. Too. See, I'm getting on you guys all No, no. Okay. Still, we're so glad to be here, you can't believe it. Okay, I had the Battle of the Balls, and then I got in the morning, and I ended up to uh, 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 Mets. And you had pneumonia. And I had pneumonia, and I was there probably. They put me right on a cot and made me stay right in the cot with a, a sputum cup. And I was coughing up all that phlegm. You know, all. And then when I got to stay there probably two, maybe three weeks, I was staying right in the hospital. And then they sent me back to, a, they called them repo depots. They were replacement depots where after you went left the hospital after being moved out of your unit, they put you in a replacement depot. And then from that replacement depot, they could send you anywhere they wanted to. Well, I wanted to get back to my own unit. So I saw one of our trucks from my unit come there to get supplies or something. And so I hitched, asked them if I could hitch a ride with them back to my... And I went back to my unit on my own so I could be with my own buddies. So you just jumped on the truck and left? Just ask him if he's all right if I ride back with him. I told him where I was from, and he said, yeah. No. I, so you assigned yourself back to your I did, <laughs> really did, yeah. So what happened after you rejoined your unit then? Let's then that's there. when we started, that's when we broke across the Rhine River. That's That's when it was... We just kept going, 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 going. You know, town, one town, the next town, the next town, clearing them up. And they gave up, more or less. They, I mean, the Germans had more or less given up by then. See, that would have been in uh, spring of 45. Yeah, spring of 45. They had more or less. You know, there weren't no fight left in them. And all of the men, you could pick up a woman pretty easy. <laughs> because well, all the men were drafted. Want to give us some details on that? Huh? Want to give us some details on that? <laughs> no. <laughs> but all the men were drafted, you know. German soldiers. He took, they took everything. You know, fight. Yeah, they called it fraternization. Oh, yeah. It's only fraternization if you get caught. Right. Sir. Yeah. <laughs> now, I see up on the wall there, obviously, you said you had shrapnel wounds, you picked up a Purple Heart, but you also have a Silver Star and a Bronze Star. The Bronze Star, of course, is, but it takes, you know, a Silver Star is quite a jump up. To, yeah, that's in the, it's it, a gallantry in action, I think. Was that in Korea, or was that in... That was in Germany in... Uh, Tell us how you got, how you came, how you Okay, I was, we place. were in this town, Pan and Musan, right here. And uh, that's where Patton, I was telling you how he rushed all the way across here. And then 
we ran out of supplies, so we dug, in, or whatever we call it, digging in. We they dug holes with with the bulldozers so we could for a place to sleep, you know, up in this hill mountain above this valley, and then across the valley, in the middle of the valley was a river, and then on the other side was another range of hills. Well, in between there, the Germans on the opposite side of that field in the in the hills, mountains. There weren't mountains, there were hills. They were dug in over there, and we were dug in here. Well, then they, I don't know, we was there for a week, maybe 10 days, something like that. And then uh, they decided to advance. Well, they thought they was going to advance Americans. And they, they had it over on the German side, they had an outpost in a in a church steeple, which was supposedly not supposed to be done by the Geneva Convention. We weren't supposed to use churches as a, you know, and uh, but they did. They had an outpost, so any any movement in this field, they had their mortars zeroed in on them. every spot was zeroed in on. You know, so as soon as you go a movement, they bang, they would come. But we, after a while, we got to know from the. P the mortars made a puh noise like that, where they'd shoot, you could just hear that. So as soon as you heard that puh, we hit the ground, see. And unless you hadn't been there long enough, didn't realize that, which happened to one of our aid men. He was a new one. He didn't used to hitting the ground as soon as he heard that, and he got shrapnel in the kidney, which at the time we saw we were taking a man back. He was helping get a man, wounded man. Out. And at the time, we didn't think it was bad because it's just that little hole, you know. And we didn't know. And, and so we kept the man on and said, we'll be back and get you in just a minute. And we went, by the time we got back to him, he was dead because it killed him down just like that. Mm -hmm. But then we would take these wounded and we would assemble them in the river, but in the, uh, uh, in, what do you call it? You know, river embankments were the lower there, you know, so shrapnel would all go over the top of you. you know, we had a whole bunch of We waited till after dark on a lot of them and uh, took them out. But then I took, I was, I kept, I was busy all the time. I, at that time I was made litter corporal, which you were in charge of, the litter bear. And I was just busy putting minor, that's what we did. First aid, more or less. You didn't do anything major. All band-aids and pressure and tourniquets and stuff like that. You know. There's nothing major out in the field. You just patched them off to get them back to the aid station where then the doctor booked them over. And anyway, that's when, I have no idea how I ever got the Silver Star. I have no idea who whoever, wrote me up or I have no idea at all. And uh, that's what I say, it's kind of bad because there was guys right with me. Well, why didn't they get it to? You know what I mean? But what about the Bronze Star? That was issued to me, which I didn't even know, and I didn't get it till after the war was over. I see in there it was issued, when, and the date, but I forgot what it was. But I didn't know I had that coming either. That was just a, it was for being over there from a certain time in, in the front lines to a certain time in the front lines. Oh, another thing, another little story. When we were in France, a buddy of mine, chocolate and uh, soap were the main bartering items, chocolate and soap. And in France, we met this older lady then. Our uh, sleeping bags, which they call them, some of them call them a fart sack and some of them call them a mummy bag. All they were was a tarp with a blanket lined, one thickness of blanket, you know. And they were not very warm. And so we talked, we, uh, this guy talked, this old lady, if, she, if we could find a comforter, would she sew it inside the, my, our sleeping bag, a nice thick comforter? And we found one, and so we traded uh, chocolate and soap for, for sewing that nice. And we were the only two in the whole outfit that had a nice warm sleeping bag. 
Okay. You had to watch it then, and I get, you know, a lot of times you, when you were moving from one spot to the other, you threw your sleeping bags in a pile in advance, and then they brought them back up to you later in the night to sleep wherever you were stopped at. And you better get there on time with them two sleeping bags, me and him, or somebody else was going to have it, you know, <laughs> because they wanted to, they knew it was a really good one. <laughs> Let's let's uh, let's take you now from the Battle of the Bulge out through the rest of your 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 uh, journey in in uh, Germany and Austria. Well, let's see here. We went to uh, Battle of the Bulge, then we went all the way up to Castles, in Germany, and then this is over the this is over where we met the we came to this Elbe River. Maybe you've heard about it, mm -hmm. and uh, we could have went on across and went occupied the whole, we could have went all the way across Germany. I mean, we were, had the momentum to do it in the, in the spies and everything. But the Russians didn't want us to, they wanted half of, half of Germany for occupation. So they stopped us here at the Elbe and wouldn't let us go any further. So then we waited there till the Germans, the Russians, and all the Germans from this area over here. That was, uh, let's see, what direction would that be? That would be what? East. All of them civilians, they were going down the road with buggies. You just wouldn't, you, you wouldn't believe it. Just roads were three wide with people trying to get out of that area before the Russians got there. They didn't want nothing to do with the Russians because they, they wouldn't kill them for, you know, and they knew we wouldn't. That's the same way with wounded men. We picked up our wounded, and if there was a German wounded there, after ours were all picked up, and then we picked up the Germans and took them and evacuated them and treated them like we were Americans. Did you speak any German at all? Or well, just a little bit enough to get booze and <laughs> other stuff. Other, other stuff. Other stuff. Other, other stuff. stuff. Other stuff. <laughs> <laughs> what, about, what about your trip from the from Battle of Bulge all the way out to to uh, uh, Eastern, yeah, Eastern Germany and then back into Austria? Was that was this an area a time when most of the German soldiers were just just giving up, or was there they were giving up when soon we reached this point here? right here? Oh, there wasn't too much. That's when I said they were, had more or less. There wasn't a lot of fight left in them, you know, because they had came to the battle. They had spent most of their resources in the bulge, Battle of the Bulge. Hitler had thought he was going to go break through there, and he, that was going to be the end of it, but it didn't happen. And so they were pretty much weakened. They didn't have a lot of people left. I mean, there were a lot of them killed. And then what about from here on to, to Austria? What was that all about? This so was just about your trip to Austria. This was just more or less scenic ride. <laughs> and uh, no fighting or no nothing, not, no calm, no thing. We just went down. And then uh, this, this little Litzen, Litzen, Austria, that's where we stayed for. And I was there for, like I say, four or five months in Army of Occupation. So, uh, and then uh, rotated back to the states from there. You but know, and that, and the, oh, I don't know if you. And our rotation back to the states was based on how how many years service you had in the army total, and then extra points for every month overseas, and extra points for the silver star, extra points for the bronze star, extra points for the silver uh, purple heart. So the more medals and the more stuff you had, the better chance you had to come home earlier. So I came home in October of 45, which I was lucky. And from October of 1945, what was it like when you got home? Tell us about when you came home from World War II. 